in this wonderful house. I don't know about you, but I'm just feeling a lot of emotion this morning in a good way. Uh, as I was here early this morning, <clears throat> listening to the praise team and praying with them and the staff, a lot of emotions flooded my heart this morning. Um, some of you may not know this, but my father was a part of this church when it was the Italian church in Detroit, which was way before my time. And this is not a history lesson this morning, but uh, I was just overwhelmed with emotion as I still am this morning. I'm not afraid to preach the word of God, but I want to handle God's word carefully. And I'm feeling a lot this morning because when my father attended this church in the 50s, by his own confession, you know, he was raised right, but like many of us at times, we take a detour in life, but thank God, God got a hold of him again. And as the story goes, as I understood it, my dad made a recommitment of his life to the Lord Jesus Christ in the year 1959, um, shortly after he had married my mother. Now they're both in heaven. But uh, my dad made a recommitment of his life and turned things around, and the rest is history. And here I am, all these years later, back to my roots here. Philomena, Martha, some of the people that their parents are also gone on, uh, the kids of us are behind, and now we're running with the baton, and we're passing the baton on to whoever will listen. So I'm really honored and humbled to be here at this church, and the love that my wife Renee and I have experienced uh, since we've been here has just been overwhelming, and even this morning. So I thank you for that. So, you know, it's been said to me, blessed are the short-winded, for they shall be asked back. So I'm going to do the best I can not to rush, but to share what's on my heart this morning from the Lord. And again, I'm honored to do this. And I just pray that the Lord would minister to you through his word and by the power of the Holy Spirit. The title of the message this morning that I had prepared is Courageous Unity. Courageous Unity. You know, pastor's theme verse for this year, and I never cease to be amazed at how the man can take one verse of scripture and just keep going and going and going and not filler, not fod, not stretching it, not making it say something that's not there, but just so much substance out of one verse. And our theme verse is Joshua 1.9. Have I not commanded thee? Be strong and of a good courage. Be not afraid, neither be dismayed, for the Lord thy God is with thee whithersoever thou goest. And I'm here to tell you again that the word of God is true. He's with us. He's with you. He's with me. And he will be with us. Amen. Wherever we go. Psalm 133 in your Bibles. I'm reading uh, today out of the New American Standard. I guess if I could put my glasses on, I would be able to see a little bit better. Can you hear me okay this morning? Okay. Psalm 133. And we're going to read verses 1 through 6. It reads this way. Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brothers to dwell together in unity. It is like the precious oil upon the head coming down upon the beard, even Aaron's beard coming down upon the edge of his robe. It is like the dew of Hermon coming down upon the mountains of Zion, for there the Lord commanded the blessing, life forevermore. And then also in Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 2, I'm going to try my best this morning to weave this together as the Lord was ministering to me what to share with you this morning. Acts chapter 2, verses 41 through 47. Acts 2, 41 through 47. So then, those who had received his word were baptized, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. And they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. And everyone kept feeling a sense of awe, and many wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles. And all those who had believed were together and had all things in common. And they began selling their property and possessions and were sharing them with all, as anyone might have need. And day by day, continuing with one mind in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart and praising God 
and having favor with all the people. And the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. And there's three things that I want to say to you today as the Lord will help me. And they are these things, and we'll try to expound on them. I want to define what unity is and what it isn't. Also, unity is a choice. And the third thing is where there is unity, it brings God's blessing. And I was talking to my wife last night and this morning, and she made an interesting comment to me, which is very true. You know, we talk about unity, but how many know it starts in the home? We have to be united as husband and wife. And we're not knocking anyone who's had issues because there's no perfect person, there's no perfect uh, family, there's no perfect church, there's no perfect marriage, but we have to be united. Can I hear an amen? We have to be on the same page. We have to be united as a family. We have to be united, first of all, with the Lord ourselves, then with our mate, with our family, and then how many know that when our families are right, it pours over into the church family. And when the church family is in unity and in one accord, God's blessing is commanded. It'll come. We won't have to try to manufacture it. We won't have to work for it. But when we're on one accord with, with the Lord, with one another, it just is an outflow and God's blessing comes. So the central truth that I want to get across to you today is that Jesus prayed for a united church. He prayed for a united church that we would be one. And in John 17, 21 through 23, it says that they all may be one. This is Jesus speaking. Father, thou art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me, and the glory which thou gavest me I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one. I in them, and thou in me, that they may may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me, and that thou hast loved me. How many know that when we're in one accord with the Lord, one accord with one another, the Lord will know that God loves us and he loves them through us because we're being an example. And, you know, I look around at this church, and since we've been here, I believe it's three years now, we've been welcomed in, we've been loved on, and of course, again, this morning, and we're just honored to, to do that and be here this morning. But where there's unity, the power of God can flow. And there's so much potential. And before we even got started, before all you came this morning, we were praying. The first note of the song, I just broke out in tears. Just overwhelmed with the goodness of God and the potential that is in this house. God is at work here in this house, and he's doing a good work through you and me, and there's greater works yet to be done. God is desiring that we would go forward. And God wants to see great things yet in this house of God here Bethel, here in Warren, Michigan. And I'm honored to be a part of it, and I know that you are. And I just want to promote unity. I want to encourage unity, and I want to inspire you to unity in your home, in your marriage, in your church family, in your community, because God wants to do great things. There's so much division in the world today, just so much. You know, I've just turned 56 years old, which doesn't mean that I know a lot, but I'm getting some gray hair, so with that comes some experience and some wisdom. Can I hear an amen? Amen. Some of you young ones yet that don't know nothing about that, wait a while. It'll happen. It comes naturally. But just embrace it because the Bible said that gray hair is a crown of glory to you if it is be found in the way of righteousness. And I believe that uh, God's got great things for us. But there's division in this world today. And uh, political parties, they can't work together. And I'm not here to preach politics. Come on, let me hear an amen. amen. I'm here to preach the word. But political parties are divided. They can't even work together to get things accomplished. I've never seen it like this in my life. And many of you that are older than me say the same thing. It didn't matter what party you were from, people got along. They had their differences, but they put them aside at a certain point and they were able to pull together and get things accomplished. In the government, in society, in communities and churches, we're living in a time where that is not the case. Thank God, I believe we're the exception here at Bethel rather than the rule. But political parties can't even come together to get stuff done because one thinks one way, one thinks the other way, and they can't agree and nothing gets done. Not good. Racial and ethnic divisions separate people and cause them not to get along. Ought not to be. I want to say to you that, you know what, it's wonderful 
to be a part of a community that's multicultural, multi-ethnic. And you know what? We've got a little bit of everything here, and all are welcome in Jesus' name. And I'm proud of that. I'm proud of that. I'm not here to toot my own horn, but I'm going to say this, that I might be getting a little ahead of myself, but I'm just going to share what the Lord put on my heart this morning. Um, I'm working with people in my Bible study group. Many of you don't know them. They're not here this morning or at this church necessarily, but we're all at different churches, but we come together monthly to minister. And, you know, I had to humble myself as this ministry that I'm doing monthly began to grow, and I had to ask for help. And I want to tell you something, people, that was hard for me to do. Not because I'm arrogant or proud or that I think I can do it all myself, but how many know it's a trust issue? Come on now. Pastor put a lot of trust in me this morning, and I'm honored by that to share the word today, and I'm honored to, to rightly try to divide the word. But as my Bible study began to grow, I had to learn to work with all kinds of people. And some of them did things maybe the way I wouldn't do them. Not so traditional, not necessarily wrong, but different. Come on now. Am I preaching right? God's been stretching me. Anybody getting stretched today? How many know that God wants to stretch us? God wants to use us. And just because we're not all alike doesn't mean that God can't work through us. And I've been learning a lesson now in these 17 years of doing this Bible study, but the last four or five especially as it's grown, I've had to give things up and delegate things out as we all have to do. And I think it was Mel Rudkowski that said something to me this summer that made a lot of sense. It, it bore witness with my spirit. He said that unless we learn to delegate and to work with others, the ministry that we have or the activity that we're doing will never grow. We've got to learn to trust people. I understand you can't just put every Tom, Dick, and Harry involved in things and trust them, but you've got to learn at a certain point to work together with people. You've got to trust them, and you've got to go forward and, and, and have confidence in them. So there's a lot of things that can separate people and cause them not to get along, but it doesn't have to be. Economic divisions emphasize the rich and the poor. How many know that that doesn't count in God's kingdom? How many know that it's nice to have money, but don't let money have you? And how many know that, you know, it doesn't have to separate us, whether we have or we have not, because if we have Jesus, we've got it all. Amen. Can I hear an amen? amen. Denominational differences exist because of doctrinal differences. And you know what? If you look at some of these doctrines that some of these people have, if you look at the way they interpret the Bible, it seems like they're right. But guess what? In heaven, we'll find out who's really right. But how many know that some of the things that we split hairs about don't mean a hill of beans? Some things are important, of course. Salvation through the blood of Jesus Christ. One faith, one Lord, one baptism. These things, of course. But some of the things that we are divided about don't really mean a hill of beans because God wants to work in and through us and the, the walls can come down and we can work together and we can advance the kingdom of God in our world, in our community, right where we're at. So all these things separate people from one another. That Although the church is made up of many different people, come on, look around. Does everybody look alike? No, we don't. No, we don't. But we can put aside what makes us different and concentrate on the fact that the precious blood of Jesus Christ has redeemed us and makes us one. Can I hear an amen? amen. Let, me hear, let, me, let me read something to you from the Word of God. 1 Peter, 1 Peter chapter 1. First Peter chapter 1 and verses 18 and 19. knowing that you were not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold from your futile way of life inherited from your forefathers. How many know that we inherited sin from our forefathers? We were born in sin, the Bible says. And silver and gold is not going to redeem us. It's nice to have nice things and money and these things, but it's not going to buy your salvation. Knowing that you were not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold from your futile way of life that you inherited from your forefathers. It was a futile way of life that we were living before Christ, but with the precious blood as of a lamb, unblemished and spotless, which was the blood of Christ. Come on, amen. And Revelation talks about that he's redeemed us from every nation, kindred, tribe, and tongue. How many know it's not just for one group, it's for all who will believe? 
Jesus died for all, but we'll all be saved? No. They have to make a decision just like you and I made a decision to be here this morning, make a decision to accept the Lord Jesus Christ. But how many know it's for all? Christ died for all. To whoever who would believe. Amen? I'm getting happy this morning. Are you getting happy? Let's talk about what unity is. Let's define it the best I can. Sometimes in order to define what something is, it's helpful to understand what it is not. Unity is not conformity. We are not alike. Scripture tells us in Psalm 139, verse 14, I believe it is, that we were fearfully and wonderfully made. That tells me that each and every one of us, before God formed us in our mother's womb, he knew us. And that he had a plan for us. In fact, Jeremiah 29, 11 says that he has a plan for us. And it's a good plan. Plans for good and not evil. For a hope and an expected end. Somebody needs to hear that today. I'm not the only one at times that gets discouraged. I'm not the only one that feels like, you know what, Lord, where's your plan for me? How many know that God has a plan? Amen. We've just got to be patient and stick with him and get to know him and keep working at it. And allow the Lord to show us his way. Amen? Amen. But we're not all alike. So what is unity? It is a state of being one, oneness. In Christian theology, oneness of sentiment, affection, or behavior, and that's taken from Noah Webster's 1828 dictionary of the English language. Listen to me. This church, like every church, like every community, even a marriage, it's two different people becoming one. Charles Stanley, who's gone on to be with the Lord, used to say this all the time. Every marriage that he performed at the altar, he says, there was four people. He says, what, a minute, what do you mean, four people? He says, there was a little boy in him, the groom, and the grown man, and the little girl, and the grown woman in her. How many know that we've all got areas in our lives that are still undeveloped, immature, and we're still growing? Come on now. I'm preaching right. So he says that that's the case. And it is what is then unity? It is oneness in the midst of our diversity. Did you get that? It's oneness in the midst of our diversity. Aren't you glad that once you learn to relax and find out that people are different but they're not all wrong, isn't it wonderful to know that they all bring something to the table? We're really, although we're all different, we're very much alike because we all need Jesus. We all need love. And how many know, Pastor talked about last week about sowing seed. How many know that today you and I are the result of seeds that were sown? People mentored us. People helped us. We are today where we're at because somebody touched our life. And I'm thankful today for many people along my life's path that have touched my life. And I'm trying to give back what God has given me because you know what? The only way to keep what you got is to give away what you have because you know what? It never leaves your life. What you sow out will come back to you. Can I hear an amen? amen? Why is unity necessary? Go with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. First Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 10. Now I exhort you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all agree, and there be no divisions among you, but you be made complete in the same mind and in the same judgment. Now, in the King James, and today I just chose to take my New American Standard with me, it talks about that we would speak the same thing. So why is it important that we have unity? Three, or three things here are mentioned. According to the King James... It's a little bit different in the, in the in new, new American Standard, but it's the same principle, that we would all speak the same thing. Now, let me ask you something. I know you've been around a while, just like I have. You're not dumb. Can you put six people on a board and have everybody think alike all the time and never disagree? No, sir. But how many know that some healthy disagreement is healthy? You can disagree agreeably. You can agree to disagree without being disagreeable. How many understand what I'm talking about? But we need the diversity. 
And the Bible tells us in the multitude of counselors, there's safety. Two or three times it says that in the book of Proverbs. But that we would all speak the same thing. It's okay to have differences of opinion. And we're all going to have them from time to time. But how many know that at a certain point, we have to put some of those differences of opinion on the shelf and we have to agree, learn to agree on what's important about our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Not what color drapes we're going to have. Not what color carpet we're going to have. Are we going to have uh, seats? Are we going to have church pews? Are we going to go with contemporary music or sing the hymns? I mean, all these things are valid questions and comments, but how many know at a certain point, in the big scheme of things, it doesn't have a whole lot to do with our salvation? Come on now. It's non-essential. So that we would all speak the thing, same thing. That's why unity is necessary. That there would be no divisions. In other words, even though we have differences, that we wouldn't let them divide us. My Bible study group that I do, you know, I, that's all I knew was the hymns. I grew up in the Pentecostal church, and I mean, I knew a few choruses, but I mean, I was way back in the 70s. And I still like those songs, and they're good. But some of my people started teasing me. They said, you know what, Morbido? We got to get you in the 21st century. And they started stretching me. And you know what? Sometimes I sing with them and I do okay. Sometimes not. But you know what? We're making a joyful noise unto the Lord and our hearts are right and that's all that matters. Amen. That's what matters. That there'd be no division. That we come together in harmony and in unity over what's really important. The blood of Jesus. Our salvation. The, the unity of the faith. The benefit of the body of Christ. That we would be perfectly joined in the same mind and the same judgment. In other words, that we would begin to think alike. What does the Word of God say? What's really important? What is really what matters most in eternity? Coming together on those things. And listen to me. Without, the flow, without unity, the flow of God's Spirit is hindered. Go with me to Ephesians chapter 4. Without unity, that flow of the Spirit is, is just hindered. And I'm thankful that the Lord is showing us all how to learn to, to get along without compromising the cardinal doctrines of the faith and, and what's really important. Amen? Amen. Ephesians 4.3, being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. How many understand that, you know what? God wants unity in His church and a bond of peace so that His Spirit can flow. And then look at verse 13, until we all attain the unity of the faith. The other things that are non-essential, we're not going to worry about. We're not going to fight about, you know. But until we attain the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a mature man, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. You know, and on this side, this wall here, as I was looking at this many weeks and again this morning, there's many cinder blocks that make up this building. How many understand that? And you and I, the Bible says, are lively stones that make up God's church. And we're built, being built up a spiritual house. And how many know that not every one of those stones is the same? They may look the same. They may not look the same. But every one serves an individual purpose to make up this house of God. That is, and so it is with you and I. We all serve a purpose. We all may not be alike. We may not all think alike. But we all come together for the common good of the body of Christ under the lordship of, the G of Jesus Christ. And as my wife and I were sharing this morning, she said something that really bore witness with my spirit, and which is what I'm trying to get across today. All things are possible to those who believe. All things are possible if we're humble before the Lord. And we're, hum we're humble with one another. And we're sincere with one another. And we can just do the work of God. And the things that might divide us, they fall by the wayside. Because just as those stones make up this building, so you and I are lively stones that are being built up to make the house of God. Can I hear an amen? Amen. And you know what? You're important. I'm important. Everyone is important because we come together and we do the work of God together. And we love one another. We love the Lord Jesus Christ and we love one another. And we see God's purposes being established in, in the earth today. Unity comes from the Greek word henotes. Again, as I mentioned, it means oneness. Uh, in Ephesians 4, 3 and 13, as I read, it describes unity, which is the unity which is to exist within the Christian church. 
It's based on clear doctrines. Listen, of one Savior, one Heavenly Father, one Holy Spirit, one baptism, and only one church in God's sight. You know, where I live, when I first moved in, I went across the street to see about this church. I thought, wow, man, this would be nice. Not that I was dissatisfied with where we were going at the time, but I said, you know what? This is like literally right across the street. I could walk to church. When I walked in there, oh, my Lord, did I get an education. I got to talking to these people, and I thought for sure, you know, they were going to welcome me, and we were going to be on the same page, maybe have some differences, but, you know, might be a place to worship. My Lord, I come to find out they believe nothing's for today. No healing for today, no water baptism. I mean, just nothing, nothing. I mean, shut her down, go home, go out of business. Come on, if that's the way we believe, if Jesus doesn't do miracles today, if he doesn't heal, I mean, why bother getting together? And I know you don't believe that way. That's why we're here today, because we sang and we believe all things are possible to him who believes. You're more than able, Lord. Come on. If you, if you believe he's more than able, just raise your hand and say he's more than able today. In Jesus' name. It's made possible, listen, by the Holy Spirit enabling Christians to exercise forbearance. You know what forbearance is? That's a high-class, old King James word for just forgiveness. How many know that sometimes we're going to rub people wrong? Hello? I've been married to that girl over there now for 15 years, and it's the best thing that ever happened to me. But do we always agree? Uh-uh. John Hagee says, you know, when you, when you get married, he calls it the urge to merge. Did you catch that? He says when, when people, when two want to become one, he calls that the urge to merge. Nothing wrong with that. The Bible says it's a good thing. Come on. But how many know that you don't always think alike? And he calls that intense fellowship. Ever have intense fellowship in your home? <laughs> on your church board, in your committees, in, in things that you, do you always agree? No, you don't. Come on. But that intense fellowship sometimes can serve either to divide you or to make you stronger because where we may rub one another wrong, we learn to forgive and to forget and keep going forward in Jesus' name. Come on now. So it's forgiveness and loving each other and by the humble, listen, intelligent use of gifts given to the church. The Bible said that he's given gifts to the church. Not everybody has the same gift, but how many know that when the gifts are working, and I believe they are in operation here, and I believe we're going to see more, but how many know that when everybody does their part, not more than their part, not less than their part, but when they do their part, how many know just like those stones coming together to make this building, everything fits, Amen. and everything works like it's supposed to be. Give God some praise this morning. Amen? Amen. The grand goal accomplished as in the unity of the faith, the Christian comes to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Thank God we're not what we used to be, and thank God we're not what we're going to be. God is still working on us, but he wants to see unity among us so that his spirit can flow. The goal of this fulfillment of David's psalm extolling the excellencies of brotherly unity and of our Lord's high priestly prayer that they all may be one. Paul urges the believers here at Philippi to realize that Christian unity by being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in spirit, in intent, listen, on one purpose. And what is that one purpose? To love the Lord your God with all your heart and love your neighbor as yourself and to serve the Lord in spirit and in truth. Come on now. It becomes possible, as my wife had mentioned to me, it becomes possible when each has the attitude of humility, which was characteristic of Christ. Let this mind be in you, like the Bible says, which was also in Christ Jesus. He humbled himself and took on the form of a what? Servant. That was the biggest thing that impressed me when I first came here. There was no show business. What you see is what you get. When I turned that corner, Greg, and I met some of you and, and Laura and different ones, and you just got to know my wife and I and just made us feel so welcome. It meant so much to us. You don't know what those hugs, those handshakes, those smiles mean to us. It really means a lot, and we try to sew it right back into you. But when we turned this corner, we saw the humility of the people, and we saw the sincerity, and there was a spirit of unity that exists here, and we give God the praise for that in Jesus' name. Say amen. amen. 
Unity is a choice. Everybody say that. Unity is a choice. As I said to you, we can let our differences divide us, and we all have differences in appearance, our likes, dislikes, our music, our, our, our styles, but what's really important? What's really important? It's the intent of one purpose, glorifying the Lord Jesus Christ and seeing people come into the kingdom, seeing them saved. Isn't that right? Yes. It takes faith and courage to have unity. As I mentioned, and I'm giving you an example, not to toot my own horn or, or exalt self, but this is the, the most prominent example that I can give you, that as I begin to see my ministry grow and have need of things, I had to learn to humble myself and say, I need help. That was scary, people. It took faith and courage. And I had some intense fellowship with my wife over it because she said, we can't do that. That's my job. But I said, you're doing this. I'm doing it. We're getting overwhelmed. How many know that sometimes you just got to say, I can't? Do you remember, Rodney, a couple of weeks ago when Pastor had us come up and he talked about Aaron and her, how they held up Moses' hands? How many know that we need some Aaron and hers in our lives to help us? Don't be ashamed to ask for help and don't be too proud to say, can I help you in some kind of way? That's where unity comes in. But it's going to take faith. It's going to take courage because we do things in a different way sometimes. It's going to take courage to minister to people who are different than we are. When I first started going into the prisons with my father, I don't do it anymore. When my father went home to be with the Lord, I gave up the prison ministry to do what I'm doing now with the Bible study. But when he took me there as an 18-year-old boy, my mother was not thrilled about her son going into the jail. Believe me, she wasn't. But it was the best thing that ever happened to me because it gave me courage. It gave me confidence, and it gave me the ability to stand up in front of folks and preach the Word of God and to teach it, and I'm honored to do that, and I'm thankful that my dad chose to take me. Um, but it takes faith and courage to minister to people who are different than you. Because you know what, we're, gonna, we're afraid. What are they going to think of us? You know, I haven't been on that side of the tracks. I have, how many know that you don't have to be in the same dredge of sin with people to tell them that Jesus loves them? How many know a little bit of love goes a long, long way? And it's going to take faith faith and courage to minister with people who may do things different. So I'm saying that a word to you as pastor, as Pastor Stephen and uh, Laura and different ones appeal to you to get involved in different departments and ministries of the church. Realize that, you know what, you may not be comfortable. And sometimes you can pray and get an answer. Go do this, go do that. But how many know that sometimes you're never going to know unless you try? Remember that Channel 4 commercial, that, they, that song that they just revived? Go for it, go for it. What you got to show if you don't try? Why don't you go for it? Now, I'm not going to sing today because that's not my gift, but how many know that you're not going to be able to do anything unless you try? One of the old timers told me in the old church that I was at, he says, you know, sometimes you'll pray and God will show you. Sometimes you just got to be like a mouse trying to get to that piece of cheese and you just start stepping out and trying. How many know that sometimes God will show you? Are you making sense today? You've got to just step out. Am I, am, I, am I helping you today? Am I making any sense to you today? The third thing I want to get across to you is that unity brings God's blessings. Listen to me. When we minister... In a spirit of unity, we're in one accord. Go with me to 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 4 through 9. When one says, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are you not mere men? For when one says, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, you are, not, you are just not mere men. What then is Apollos? And what is Paul? Servants through whom you believed. Listen, one plants, one waters, but it's God that gives the increase. That's where we're at. One, 
one plants, one waters, God gives the increase, but each one is doing something, and neither is more important or less important than the other, but we're all working together for one common goal, the lordship of Jesus Christ being expressed and people coming to the saving knowledge of him. Verse 6, I planted, Apollos watered, but God was causing the growth. So then neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything but God who causes the growth. Now he who plants and he who waters are one, but each will receive his own reward. How many know that you can't do nothing for God without being blessed and rewarded? We don't do it to be blessed, but we are blessed because we did it with the right attitude and with one accord. Now he who plants and he who waters are one, but each will receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are God's fellow workers, and you are God's field and God's building. Just like I talked about the stones, the, the bricks that make up this building. Listen, people. Where the power of God, or where they were in one accord, according to Acts 2, 1 through 4, the power of God fell. It says that they were all in one accord on the day of Pentecost, and then the Holy Ghost fell. How many know that he still falls today when we're in one accord? He still moves. We sang, he still moves. He still moves, and he does. We're all on the same team. And I heard one minister define that, that word team this way, T-E-A-M. Together, everyone accomplishes much. Together, everyone accomplishes much. That's what a team is. There's no I in team. It's together, everyone accomplishes much. And you know, I want to talk to you real quick about Nehemiah. We, Pastor or Stephen mentioned a, a few weeks ago about the wall being built. Nehemiah was able to rebuild the wall because the people had a mind to work. That phrase always stuck with me because the people had a mind to work. All things are possible. We sang about it this morning. The Word of God teaches it. All things are possible when people are humble, when they're in one accord, and they have a mind to work. How many know that there's a community out here in Warren and beyond that needs the Lord Jesus Christ? And you know what? When we work together, we can get something done for the kingdom of God. That wall was finished in 52 days, and the enemies lost their confidence because they recognized it was accomplished by the help of God. Listen, this morning I didn't take this lightly, but I knew that by the help of God, and only by the help of God, I could share this message today. Message today, And I pray that it touched your heart. When unity is present, all things are possible and miracles are wrought. Mark 16, 20 says, 16, 20 says that the Lord worked with them everywhere, confirming the word with signs following them. As I just read to you in Acts 2.43, it says that they had all things in common and that the Lord wrought miracles among them. The awe of the Lord, the fear of the Lord fell upon them. What would it be like if we walked in here today and every week thereafter and said, you know what, I'm not going to worry about what's different about my neighbor or what Maybe I wouldn't do this way or that way, but we just come together and love the Lord and love one another and get busy in this community and start doing the work of Jesus, which we are doing for the glory of God. But how many know there's greater things yet to be done? United we stand, divided we fall. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable and easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits without partiality, without hypocrisy, and the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. Are you with me today? Till we all come, as I said, to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man and unto the measure of the fullness of Christ. I'm just going to wrap up with this. I could say more, but again, blessed are the short-winded, for they shall be asked back, and I don't want to wear out my welcome. Did you get something today? Yes. Listen to me. How many remember Russ Taff, contemporary Christian music? I don't know what made me think of this. I wasn't a big contemporary Christian music guy, but I remember back in the 80s that uh, this song, and I couldn't remember the songs. I was going to call you, Pastor Stephen, because I figured you'd know. But I had to look it up, and I got the words to this song. I'm not going to try to sing it, I promise you. But I want you to listen to the words, to the lyrics okay, of this song. 
It's called We Will Stand by Russ Taff. Here's what it says. Sometimes it's hard for me to understand why we pull away from each other so easily. Even though we're walking the same road and we build dividing walls between our brothers and ourselves. Listen here. Well, I don't care what label you may wear. If you believe in Jesus, you belong with me. The bond we share is all I care to see. We can change this world forever if you will join with me. Join and sing. And this is what the chorus says, and I, some of you will remember it. You are my brother, you are my sister, so take me by the hand. Together we will work until he comes. There's no foe that can defeat us when we're walking side by side. As long as there is love, we will stand. And I'm going to close it there. And I'm going to turn it over to Pastor Stephen. And I will say this to you. We'll have an open altar call as Pastor Stephen closes the service. If you need prayer for unity in your home, in your marriage, perhaps maybe between yourself and someone in this body today, my wife and I and others would be happy to pray for you. Or if you need prayer for anything else, we'd be happy to pray for you. And it'd be honor, our honor to do that. And I thank you from the bottom of my heart for this opportunity to share the word of God with you. Love you all. God bless you.